Okay, so on the screen, that's what we are going to do t today. Um, remember, uh, uh, last week lecture, we didn't finish the last uh, dimensionality reduction technique. It's called FIT. It's a new program uh, recently published. It claims you can keep the original global structure between your data points. Uh, that this claim is not true for TSNI or UMAP. TSNI and UMAP are stochastic based. It only take care of the distance between data points, whether they are close to each other or not. If they're close to each other to a certain threshold, you're more likely to be the uh, linked neighborhood members. Other, otherwise, you just randomly put anywhere. So yeah, when you embedding your high dimensional data points using TSNI or UMAP, you lost the global structure. What that means if you have two data points are far away enough to each other, you, you don't consider it as members, then you can put them anywhere in your low dimensional space, 2D or 3D. That's why, that's why if you uh, uh, pay attention to some Twitter discussion recently and the people in population genetics using uh, uh, genetic diversity information from a human uh, DNA sequence to put human individuals uh, using UMAP or TSNI to map the human uh, relationship. And that was wrong because if you have two individuals that differ enough, uh, then you just randomly put them in the low dimensional space. And uh, you, the TSNI map and the UMAP will not reflect the real relationship between those individuals. So uh, this paper published in Nature, I believe, had been criticized by uh, machine learning field. And the population genetics probably don't know the algorithm, the underlying uh, algorithm. So they, they just use that to visualize the relationship between African, European, Asian, but uh, that's the distance between those uh, make no sense at all. Uh, after that, uh, we will look at the k-means and db-scan uh, spectral clusters, so all uh, built-in function in machine learning and the statistic toolbox released by uh, MATLAB, the company MathWorks itself. Um, we can use their documentation provide examples to look at those uh, algorithms. And then we probably will use real single cell data to repeat what we have, so to make connections between those very general uh, algorithm of the clustering and see how you can apply to your single cell data, OK? And then we will play with SC3. And we have this function built in the toolbox. So through the interface, you will get a feeling of how long it will take compared to the k-means. Just give you some ideas of why and why it's justified or not to use that. OK? I believe Luis will have a sub demonstration of his uh, optimization procedures. And I don't know how long it will take, Luis. Ten minutes, great. Okay, and then I have a. It's a guest lecture, and uh, from uh, Michael Salins, and he's a postdoc in uh, nutrition department, and I. Uh, he's not. Be, we will not be here. I will. I play the Zoom uh, video, and he talked about the annotation of the cell type, uh, to give you the impression uh, how exactly this workflow should work. Okay. We have a one-click solution, and you get everything from the top to the end. But Michael will show you a real, real-world application. He uses his understanding of his data, data points, his cell type, and using so-called manual annotation. And I believe this procedure is very uh, uh, insightful, and uh, we should learn the, the 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 process and see how he can combine his pre-knowledge about the cell type you know from the pre literatures to identify those markers and uh, to manually annotate each cell groups. This, this talk will take uh, 20 minutes about. So that's our agenda for today. Is that OK? 
Okay, uh, so this machine learning uh, application, which is the method behind uh, the FATE, the program. It's called manifold learning, and manifold is a like, uh, high dimensional structure of mathematical uh, object, objective. Uh, uh, this object uh, have a feature which this data points from this one to uh, the other one, if you, you cannot jump, you have to go through the whole structure to reach that location. Uh, if you can see my point here, and uh, if you measure the distance between this point in the center here to this point, it looks not too far away, right, from the Euclidean distance. But uh, if you consider this manifold structure, you have to go move small steps and cross all over this uh, Swiss, Swiss roll shape until you can reach this point. Uh, so that's why you cannot trust the directly con calculate the Euclidean distance in high dimensional structure. If you believe your, your data was somehow distorted in the, this more complex uh, structure, you have to follow small steps and travel all, all the way along this framework, okay, this manifold to reach another data point. So if this linear relationship, the Euclidean distance, uh, does not hold for this structure, so you have to consider different ways to understand the relationship between your data points. So that's a manifold learning try to do. And this method is start from a uh, look at the pairwise distance first. Okay. Um, so this is like a Euclidean distance we defined between each data point, so the pairwise. So once you have that, then you can start to do a cutoff. If you have a uh, distance uh, very small, then you, you believe you can have one step or two steps to reach from one point data point to another. But once you away from this uh, uh, threshold, and you, you don't consider you can directly jump from one to another. So using this so-called filter, the, the, the kernel function, and to uh, filter out those long distance links between data. So after you trim off those long distance link, you live up with this so-called local uh, relationship preserved connections, okay? So you learn from this structure to understand uh, uh, the relationship between data points, although the, the relationship are very complex. So this is the idea. So uh, this is a paper published in uh, several years ago and uh, becomes one of the uh, popular uh, application uh, dimensionality reduction algorithm in single cell data uh, application uh, analysis applications. So we have options. You, you have PCA, the very fundamental, 100 years old, and you have a TSNE UMAP, which relatively new and about what 10 years ago and very popular and then this this two like five years ago and you have a three different type major different types of these uh, algorithms you can choose from um, I t in the in the core of this uh, method uh, it is MDS okay I hope you still remember what MDS is MDS is a uh, multi-dimensional uh, scaling. Uh, remember, we have this map between different cities. Okay, you have from one city to another by train, how many kilometers? Uh, city two to three. So you have this distance matrix. So dimensional scaling is uh, dimensionality scaling is to build from distance matrix to a regenerative map, basically, for the cities. So at the last step of the FATE algorithm is MDS. But before that, uh, we need to have a distance matrix between cells. And then you have distance matrix, and you use MDS to map those cells into the map. Okay. 
But before you cannot do this distance matrix directly because the relationship not reflect the real distance between cells. Some cell although looks very similar or uh, close to each other, but if you follow the cell's development trajectory, you have to go uh, from different states to different states, a lot of intermediate states. So this method starts from a distance matrix. So you have data and you compute the distance between uh, cells. And then using this filter, okay, to transform distance into some terminology called affinity. So how, basically how closer each of these data points are. So through this transformation and use some diffusion probability method, but essentially the transformation or uh, uh, procedures to change the distance measures. Okay, after that, the last step is to use MDS to, to generate the map. So this is a very typical machine learning uh, uh, algorithm uh, using uh, a lot of this distance, uh, kernel, affinity, uh, diffusion, uh, MDS, but the, the, you have to understand the core is to MDS itself, it, MDS. But before MDS has some distance transformation, that's all. So MDS allow you to keep the global structure. So the, the, the cell in this, this corner here will be very different from this corner here. So this map will be uh, a, a claim, is claimed to keep the global structure of the cell relationship. Okay? It's different from the TSNI or your map. Okay, so I have my uh, toolbox. So I want to show the uh, TCNE embedding, what's different from UMAP. Yeah, I made some modification for the interface, but essentially they are the same. Um, so you have import, I will use example data again. Um, this time I use raw data without any process, processing. So no structure yet. And uh, um, then you select this button here to select the different embedding algorithm. Okay, that's what you'll see, okay? T, Disney, UMAP, and the feed. All right? Uh, this is a relatively new, but it is small, uh, slow, and that's why there are turtle here. Uh, the publication you can read. This method basically try Disney UMAP and the fate all together using different parameters, then take a consensus. Okay, that's why it's slow. It have to do quite a lot and then build another uh, visualization. So now I, I will use fate instead of other two. So uh, you will see the, the result looks different. I hope no bug. Yeah, you can choose fate. Yeah. So if you look at the behind this, uh, the common one, the window, and those steps, MDS is here, diffusion steps. So everything uh, is there. Stopped. Yes, it's still working on my computer. So later we will talk about the so-called pseudo time. Pseudo time analysis. 
So this is based on the, the projection of the cells. So if you have your cell uh, after dimensionality uh, reduction, you, you have a cells arranged like this. And in this case, you can uh, build a hypothetical pathway. So we see at this as my start point. I, I pick one of the cell from this boundary of this cloud and then build a trajectory and go through most of the cells. And then I think this is the end. In this way, I can build a, a pseudo time curve. So this curve can be uh, regarding as a, say that if you believe this starting point, like time one, time zero, and then you move steps and to time n. Okay, you create a time point for each of the cell along this trajectory. I encourage you, you can do this after you finish fate inviting. Okay, you can find this trajectory here and maybe extract the cells to do this. But I don't suggest you to do this using inviting generated from a TSNI or your map. Okay, so if you, if you have X matrix, I use TSNE or your map create the inviting. Don't do pseudo time with that. Fate is okay. The reason is the fate keep the global structure for these cells. Okay? This is an algorithm uh, guaranteed or inbuilt in there. Tissing your map definitely no. Okay, because once you move away from each other, there's no relationship between them. How can you just choose, how can you decide which one you choose? You just try to choose three different ways and... There are many different ways, and uh, you have used your own knowledge at the end. See, I, I want to use, uh, I want to study one of this trajectory, or this. So you can extract cells. Yeah, embedding is before clustering. Okay. Yeah. So we haven't done any clustering yet. But, but this is a little bit jump, but I just gave you some idea that why fate is valuable. And uh, uh, OK, the developer makes this really fast as well. So it's OK, uh, any questions? Any questions? So you can see a lot of the trajectories using fate. Okay. But fate is not very good for clustering because clustering we want to have a one cluster and another group, right? And if you apply uh, k-means to this, you know, as I, as we we said in the lecture is. K means not good to deal with this kind of structure. It's good for like one cloud, one cloud, cloud. Okay. So uh, in this case, I will uh, change. Uh, I can I can use U map for demonstration. Right? Oh, you can, because this is an example data have already run, uh, run through this. So you can just you select existing ones and don't have to recompute. Yeah. 
So you can recompute, then you get something like this, okay? Mm. So this is a, a beautiful uh, 3D structure, and we can uh, easily do this uh, k-means algorithm uh, with this. So it's a tree here, okay? So there, there are two buttons. One is so-called clustering using cell embedding. Basically, it's using uh, the 3D data points. And uh, forget about all the expression, because uh, we already embed or reduce dimension to 3. So uh, the algorithm will only consider 3D position relationship between those points. And the button next to it is to uh, clustering using original x the expression matrix. So that will be the high dimensional, not only 3D. So this method, if you click this, this will be uh, the only option I provided as C3 because I. I didn't. I don't. I didn't find any other algorithms better than SC3. You do you have a lot. I mean, different uh, uh, publications. You can make say a claim, I'm, but none of them uh, good enough. So I only keep which reasonable. So we can jump. Uh, uh, let's let's cancel this first because according to our agenda, we will try k-means first. Okay. So that's what the. Uh, so we have a fate and the UMAP two embeddings available for us. On, on this graph here uh, is UMAP 3D embedding, so we can select this. And uh, then we select K means algorithm, and this is automatically generated. The numbers of K, remember, you have to provide this K and in order to let K means to find how many uh, clusters in there. Oh, you can because uh, if you if you run this using Tisney, uh, you will have that option because we haven't run that. But if you decide to run Tisney, then you have uh, three options. You have a uh, fate, UMAP, and Tisney. Oh. Yeah. So if you select different K, uh, I still use. Yeah, K means if you use different K, uh, so I will 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, maybe 10, uh, you will get, okay, different picture. And uh, um, okay, so normally this is a, okay, and you can start to do the cell type annotation for each of these clusters. Um, the one I just showed you, this very messy picture, this over cluster uh, picture, because I want to uh, make many small clusters and uh, let algorithm to estimate or guess the cell types. And then if, if different clusters share the same cell type name, I will merge them later. You can also do this, because in this case, it's very clear. This is one cell type here. So you don't have to over cluster to separate them, this one into three or four different subclusters and merge later. You can, you can just directly say, OK, this is one cell type, and I will work on that. Um, Ten cluster, uh, yes. If you believe there are eleven, then you can add one. You can make changes here if you decide. See, okay. For example, uh, 
I will use brush here to select these two groups. Okay, you, you see here there are uh, this scarlet red and orange, these two clusters. I, I, I want to merge them into one. I can select and click uh, merge. They should merge clusters and make seven, nine, these two and uh, merge into one. Okay. So you can make some uh, small adjustment if you if you need. All right. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. Now I want to look at the k-means. If you look at the documentation, um, let's see the which k-means. Um, if you see, if you use which function, it will tell you where this function is. The file is located. Okay. If you remember the function file is end with dot m, so extensions m file, and this. This function is located under the MATLAB itself, the toolbox and the statistics, okay, statistics toolbox within this. Yeah. We can open this documentation and look at the definition uh, and how to use this method. Okay, so the basic use, you need at least two parameters. One is the data, okay? Data is big X. Remember this big X, we send it to big X uh, to the k-means. It's not the original uh, single cell expression matrix. What we send to it is embedded. So after this embedding, and we have, so this is, a, uh, see, uh, we transpose it. Okay, so this will be cells by genes. Okay, so this original data matrix contains thousands of genes. But after we did this UMAP or uh, Tisney embedding, what we get, this X, like this small X, this data, that's our input for k-means. In this case, we still have the same number of cells, but what's the, how many, variables in the column, do you believe? Is this still the number of genes? No, because we have done this dimension reduction and it becomes 3D. Yeah, so this is a S1, S2, S3. So if you use 3D embedding, each cell was defined by X, Y, Z. Okay, it's location in your, in your figure. So this is only 3D data. So that's what we send it to uh, k-means function. So k-means take a small x, and the k is your defined 10, for example. OK, so that's our input, not the original. Can you put original in? You can, but maybe sm slower. That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You should be able to directly give this big, big X to K. I believe so. Yeah. That's right, yeah. I haven't tried how long it will take, but it shouldn't take too long. Uh, but, uh, but this will be uh, directly cluster your embedded cell uh, 
data points rather than the original uh, cell profile, and it will make more sense because you you visually see okay this is a cluster, but if you use this because there's a nonlinearity within the cell, maybe uh, you didn't cluster all the cells in that group in together. You may have cells in that particular cluster looks same cluster, but the, the, the k-means gave you different membership. Okay. So translate this into our function here. Um, so let's see how we can do this. Okay. Uh, assume we haven't done the clustering yet. Now you can export export these variables. Um, so now we need s. Okay, s is your embedding. It's basically is this. Okay, this is a small s. So if you want to do cluster uh, based on this, you can export small s. And the small s, this variable contains the number of cells. We have 8,396 cells and three columns. Okay. These three columns define the position of each cell. So that's the variable we can give to k-means. Is that clear? Okay, rather than the original big X. The output is index. Give small here, okay? Then K, if we have a, if I cluster them into three D, okay? Three clusters. No, not three D, like, like four clusters. Then the output, the index, will be either 3 or 2, 1 or 4. That's the indicator of the membership ID for each cell. Okay. So if you can get this. Is that clear? Okay. Yeah. So we run k means rather than the original big X. We directly cluster its embedding based on the position of their embedding in the 3D space. And then we ask for, give me four categories, four groups. And this index variable will tell you, okay, the first cell is in cluster number three, second cell is in cluster number four, something like that. Okay, so that's what we need. Remember, you can plot this as two second column as three okay I generate a figure a new figure um, and using cluster three function to put my embedding into the 3d space okay so that's what you'll see in this. Okay, you can still rotate this already. <coughs> yeah.
Now I want to label different clusters because I have four clusters, one, two, three, four. I want to show them in different colors. I just need to put that index into uh, this function. Uh, because it's scatter three, scatter three will take that. So I've put empties here and put an index here. Um, this position is the size of your marker, okay? If you leave this blank, just like empty, uh, I believe the program will use by default the five size size of five. So if you want to make this bigger, you can see, okay, 10 will have a very big bubble uh, for each marker. But you can leave this like that. And the next will indicate different color, give it different color indications. So if you run this, you should have these four clusters show in different colors. Okay. Now let's consider where those information are from. So in our workspace, there are only two variables. The first one is S, this small s, is how many cells and the position of each cell, x, y, z position, in this figure, right? And the second variable is index. Basically, it tells you the membership ID for each cluster of each cell. So that's all the information we have. Uh, we put the position, first, second, third, that 3D position in this column to give this scatter three function, tell it where the, to plot those points. Then give this index to let it to decide whether you should use different colors to, to show the next point in the, the graph. Okay. If you run, for example, I rerun k means, this time I use 10 different colors. And the index will change uh, to indicate whether this cell belongs to group one or two or three or four, five, up to 10. Um, you can regenerate this uh, scatter plot you also using color um, in this case you have 10 different colors in reality okay Okay, any questions with the k-means? So if you go back to documentation of k-means, uh, in the example MATLAB provided, is the example uh, fisheries, okay? So that's a 2D. Okay. I, I believe that's a different species. Then based on this 2D, the, the length of pedal width, and then you can 
cluster different fish uh, into three major subspecies. And then you can uh, run those examples and cluster them into three groups. And this example is randomly generated two clusters. And then you can uh, color them differently, and then also found the central noise. OK. They use a function called the G cluster. It's similar to what I did, like a 3D cluster with the index, the, the, the color. But they put the index here, OK? OK, now we, uh, we can come back here. Uh, yeah, come back to here. And uh, um, we, we will take a look of another uh, DB scan, OK, DB scan. Let's see which. In the same position, it's a function built in in this statistics toolbox. <coughs> Unlike a k-means, db scan requires three parameters. X is your input. You can give either this or small s. Um, then you need epsilon and the minimum points in the subclusters there. <coughs> OK, in here, instead of index, for example, instead of using k-means, I can try db scan, uh, say, five different. Oh, uh, it's not a k, so I need two numbers here. Um, epsilon, say, 0 0.2, and five data points, something like that. I don't know how to predefine or determine those hyperparameters. OK? So I just try this and see whether um, what it will give to me. Yeah, those five is the minimum numbers of the required. Yeah, so you, you change the parameter here and like say, ten. Okay, you require ten numbers to be in the next radius as a as so called. You can you can keep growing your clusters and this will merge more cells. And uh, um, I don't know how to change these parameters, but. Uh, you get very different results uh, like this, OK?
So DB scan, uh, those numbers are not uh, how many clusters you want to generate. I have no control. It's all based on data point itself. Okay. <coughs> We don't need, we, we don't know how to control those parameters, so we don't use DB scan at all. But it's one of the options if you have uh, a density problem, because a lot of cells look scattered around, but there are some cells very dense. Maybe some special cases we use DB scan. So usually we use k-means. We use k-means to be enough, yeah. Mm -hmm. But but as as a lecture, I just show you their options. Yes? What is the number of the points you have in the time? What is that the parameter score? This parameter tells you how you grow, your, how you move your mm -hmm. uh, subcluster focus. So this algorithm will draw a lot of circles. And then within a circle, if you have, a, for example, you define 10, if there are 10 cells in there, uh, they will it will consider, okay, this sub subcluster, it start to move a little bit. If next point you have only nine points, then it will stop here and introduce another new cluster, start to grow. Uh, if you make this number small, instead of 10, you see five, and then this, this small bubble will keep going and until you stopped somewhere, there's no five bubble, or five points in that bubble. So this gave you uh, some behavior control of this. Uh, but okay. So one point five. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so Kagada, Kagada just tried these combinations. Um, then for this data points. Uh, looks like, okay, we get uh, some good results. Um, yeah. Yeah, maybe in some case, you worth trying out some of the combinations of parameters. Uh, Okay, uh, so let's try. Which spike control cluster? Okay, same toolbox. And the look at its documentation. Mm -hmm. Yes. So when we were trying to do frequency of people, mm -hmm. oh, this is the size of your your, your marker, the, the circle in the plot. Um, yeah, if you you want a big circle, you you can pick a ten or yeah, control the size of this. Yeah, um, spectrum cluster algorithm allow us to have two parameters, input and k, and k I believe is the number of the clusters you can have. Okay. So same, uh, 
same as k means basically. Let's see if six let's, let's try spectral. Okay, same uh, Okay, this is a result using spectral cluster and uh, cluster cells into six groups. Maybe I change the number to 11. Right. This is just a very basic use if you decide to use common line to do this. Um, yeah, I believe all this algorithm you can apply to embedding. So this uh, dimension reduced data set. So you can consider that as, as your input data set, even without, see, okay, this one, because you already reduce the dimension to, to this, and uh, you want to class the cells. But you can still, if you decide to use original, but just remember the transpose is make, make the cell by gene. And uh, because those, those clusters, all these functions will take a matrix, which rows are the cells, and the columns are the variables to define those cells. OK? Yeah, so for the input for those functions, either k-means or this, or db-scan, they all take input and consider rows are the samples, are the cells. And the columns are variables to define the properties of those cells. So if you put it wrong, if you transpose this cells, and you will get an index only for three, data points because it will consider this three data. Uh, if you don't transpose this, put original X, you will cluster genes rather than the cells. In some study, you do want to cluster genes, see whether you can use the cells uh, expression profiles to define the group of genes which express similar across those cell populations. Okay, so those are the three uh, built-in function in uh, MATLAB built-in function. Then um, here I want to close, click this to close all other figures that only keep this original. Last you. So now before the break, I can uh, we can see. Okay, I want to use cluster cells using this. Okay, use SC three and remember SC three the procedure. Um, in here, I remember there's one page. Okay, so this is SC3. The input for this is this original, okay? It's gene by cell. Um, so we don't need to invite the cell to 3D to give the, it, it will just use this directly to compute the distance between cells by itself internally. So, um, 
that's why in this menu, uh, the suggestion is to cluster cells using expression matrix X directly rather than the embedding uh, coordinates of the cells. So here I say yes, this will take some time so we can have a break. And I just apply this and then there's no, uh, see how many options. How many we should have? One, two, three, four, five. Let's see 12, okay? Uh, well, some, something wrong, so uh, we probably not be able to test this. Let me do a filtering. Uh, there's a bug in my code, so we cannot do it today, okay? Yeah. But uh, anyway, we can take a break, right?
demonstration uh, on her computer to, uh, on his computer to see the optimization procedures okay yeah hello uh, everybody good morning um, this will be very short um, just remember um, the pseudo code of the uh, uh, sort intelligence algorithms we have a search space and some particles trying to find um, a, a good solution that may be the uh, the best solu uh, uh, optimal solution, right? Just remember, uh, these metaheuristics cannot guarantee that we are getting the uh, the best solutions, right? This is uh, the trade-off. So you remember, we have a um, uh, function, and we need to find uh, the minimum value or the maximum. And here, um, I have an implementation. Uh, I did some years ago, actually maybe eight years ago. So uh, we have an implementation here and um, okay, no, sorry. And we have some parameters. Uh, actually, this program is running in C++. C, C++. Uh, it's not the, the best framework to, <laughs> to implement uh, an algorithm, but um, we have as uh, here uh, di two dimensions. We are, I, I will f I show you two dimensions. Uh, some particles. Uh, these is, are the, uh, the hyperparameters, and we can use, for example, uh, three functions, uh, three benchmark functions. Uh, for example, Rosenbrock. And uh, this algorithm have some parameters: uh, number of iterations, the, the particles to start. We can use more particles, but um, uh, what is the difference if we use more particles? I mean, uh, some difference uh, points in the function, we have the risk to get a uh, sync into the, uh, the, the search space. So if we use less particles, maybe we cannot uh, converge. So this is the trade-off. So I, I will use 50. And this topology of how the particles uh, communicate uh, each one or between them, global, local, uh, focal. I, I will use global and some other uh, coefficients. So I will graph G best and P best, and let's start the, the, the implementation. So you can see uh, 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 the, in the one step, uh, let me uh, slow down. In the very beginning, uh, we have the, uh, a random initialization. So the particles are, are trying to go to the zero in that case. It's a minimization problem. So we can see, okay, maybe we need to, yes. We can see how the particles are moving as a, this is a PSO actually. Uh, is is um, copying the behavior of the birds in, in, the, in the swarm. So, uh, here is the, the the global best value, and he, well, it's not showing anything, but is, this is the, the 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 average of the p best. So at the at the end, I'm gonna increase the velocity. At the end, the, the particle is is finding the the zero that is the minimum value, but is is not getting sync because uh, the particles are uh, enlarging or are moving around the search space. So at the very end, okay, 
here we, we can see how the, the swarm is moving uh, through the search space and at the very end, so uh, here we have 100 uh, iterations. So let's increase the velocity. So we can see how the, the particles are uh, converging to the zero point. So th th this is the beauty of this kind of algorithms because a fine value, but um, don't get uh, or don't let uh, the rest uh, influence uh, totally. So the particles can, uh, can um, avoid uh, to get sync. So we can see the, the GBEST and the PBEST, and okay, we can let the algorithms uh, running and maybe in the 2,000 or three or 5,000 iterations, it can get into the zero value. That is, uh, in that case, is the global optimum. So you can see is, so yeah. So at the, at the very end, so the algorithm is going to find the optimal value. But in that case, is, this, is, uh, this is a Rosenbrock, right? We, we can try a, a sphere. A sphere is simplest one. Um, is a simplest one uh, a function. And is the algorithm converge uh, uh, faster than the, in the Rosenbrock. So you can see, and goes to to zero. So it, you can see the difference uh, in, in the GBES, for example, it goes to zero in the very fast com in comparison with the previous one. So yes, so here we have the, the values in zero. So re just remember uh, the functions, the benchmark we are uh, using, uh, this is a sphere, it's a very easy function to test and the Rosenbrock is different, and this one is a raster engine. So what happens if we, if we use raster engine, and we can, uh, we can set three dimensions, for example. And let's see how the behavior of the algorithms, oops, let's decrease the, oops, I need to stop and start again. So, yes. So we, 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 we can see uh, this is the, the, uh, the rest, uh, raster new function, but is taking only, f let's see. Um, okay, we can, well, this is not the best way to, to watch, but let me restart. Maybe there is uh, some bug. And raster engine. Oops, sorry. Yeah, it's taking only a few particles. So at the very end, uh, the particles gonna converge in one point. So yeah, maybe the the three dimensions no is not working properly. So, but this is the uh, the general idea. Uh, using a particle swarm optimization, it's a swarm intelligence algorithm. Related with uh, GA, GA or uh, genetic algorithms, I have an implementation uh, in, uh, using Python in Google Colab. I can actually, I can share with you this file, this notebook. Uh, if you use um, Google Colab uh, or Python, sorry, uh, uh, Google Colab is just an a online platform to run a Python code, and we can use for free. That is good. And we have a, a, the, in, we import the, li the libraries, and we have the class. In, the, actually, this, this example is in Spanish. I can translate to English. Uh, sorry, I was <laughs> teaching in a Spanish class. So, this is the, in, uh, the, in, the individual or uh, the gene, right? In, in the gene, we can, um, we can map the values for, uh, for our uh, parameters. Uh, I, I explain here all the characteristics. And 
uh, the initialization of the algorithm. Actually, I can, I can run. The run is connecting. Yes. Okay. I can run the individual. Um, I, we, I have here all the, the, the actions of the interaction of, of the algorithm. Um, uh, I, for example, like I, I, here I, I, I have the mutations, operator, the selection, and um, the, some distributions. Uh, okay, this is the population. So how many, uh, how many chromosomes or individuals inside the population? Um, let's see, okay, I can go to the very end, just because the time. No, 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 uh, it's because I am explaining, uh, it's, it's very complex, I can reduce actually, and it's, it's easier, it's easier. So maybe it's, it's from here, I, I, I create here the mutation, uh, the, the mutation rate, do you remember the, the entire chromosome? And the mutation rate is how, uh, uh, how percentage of the chromosome I'm going to trans transfer to the next one or uh, to use to create new, new individuals. So in that case, is 50%. So is, is maybe it's not the best example because uh, we can have a, a very high diversity. So... I have all the, uh, the values here to know uh, what is happening for every generation and here. So how I select the individuals, uh, we can use tournament, rank, or a wheel, uh, I forgot in English, it's a wheel, uh, is it randomly, for example, it's like uh, using a, a wheel. So um, this, is, this is all the implementation, uh, yes, maybe I can need to, to to reduce or simplify. So this is the function I am testing. This is my uh, objective function, and I need to go to this point to the uh, to ma in order to maximize. Okay, this is a maximization problem, and at, at the very end, the algorithm, the particles need to come here, right? Using contours. Okay, is 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 this function, but uh, it's a different view. So the algorithms, uh, this is implementation, and this is the um, best individual uh, graph. So in along the, the generations, the algorithms is, uh, can go to the very top of the function. And yes, uh, uh, this is the video here. So we can see the, the genes moving uh, across the, the function and quickly coming to the very top of the function. Using this uh, mutation or a selection mutation in crossover uh, operators. So this is the beauty of this, uh, this kind of algorithms. Obviously this is, this is a very easy problem. So you can have a problem with uh, is a high dimensional problem and you can mix for example with a manifold uh, learning and yeah, you can, okay, it's not moving the particles, right, oh, no. But yes, uh, as we see in the first example, so uh, we can have the, the genes uh, m the, or the individuals moving uh, through the search space in order to uh, go to the very top of the function, okay? Yeah, so maybe this example here is very, <laughs> is very complex. So I can, I can uh, reduce, uh, simplify and share with you and you can use uh, you can open the notebook in Google Collab and run every cell uh, or every part of fragment of code and you're going to see the, the program uh, running, okay? So this is, this, this is the very short example uh, I brought, so, okay? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, cool. Maybe you can share the link to the link of... Yeah, uh, no, I, I will share the, the, the file, uh, you, so you, you, you can open the file in Google Collab, and uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now we are going to invite another guest speaker.
from nutrition department through Zoom. Uh, It's, it's, it's incomplete. Um, it's still missing some data, but I did want to. Victoria's not here, but I did want to share it just so you know you guys can get an idea of so what I'm doing while I'm sitting at my desk. So it's really the identification of all the different cell types in the mouse colonic tissue. Um, so there are some data processing steps. Um, the first one is filtering based on the QC plot, and I'll talk a little bit more about that and how I decide what to filter. Um, then it comes to the identification or the separation of colonocytes versus the non-colonocytes. These non-colonocytes are really just going to be the immune and the stromal cells that are, that are also in these samples. And then once I can separate those, I can focus on the colonocytes and I can then start to try to identify all the different subtypes of colonocytes um, in, in these scripts. And I'll talk again more about this uh, in a bit. So, this is um, the colon tissue. So we isolate this colon tissue. This is a human, but we get it from mice. Um, and we have start now started using the whole intact tissue. And what I mean by that is before we were just kind of taking off this top part, this epithelial layer, and then sequencing that. But we do know that down here is the in the muscle layer is where all the blood flow is, all the immune cells are, and they are also responding um, to things like diet. So we're now interested in looking at the whole colon tissue. So we now have all tissue there. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like at a cross section. Um, at the top here, you have the epithelial cell cells. These are the colonic crypts that are right here. And then down here, this is where you have your immune cells, your blood vessel cells, muscles, all different kinds of fibroblasts that give nutrients to the colonic crypt um, stem cells at the bottom. Um, it's all there. So everything is important, and I think it's good that we have started doing this, but it does make the data a little bit more challenging. And as you can see, within these crypts, there are a ton of cells really squeezed in here. Um, and even in the center of the crypt, some of these circular things are part of um, goblet cells. So if we use a different staining, we can kind of see that the blue here are those goblet cells. Um, and so we can capture all of this with our single cell data. So we have all of these different cell types here in the colon. This is just a simplified version of that. And this is what we've been using to do um, some RNA-C. Uh, so the first thing, like I mentioned, is the QC filtering. Um, this is really going to depend on whether you're using flex or the three prime uh, sequencing. Um, the flex is really clean data. You almost don't need to filter this data. If you do filter it, it would be just to kind of get rid of these cells that have a high mitochondrial uh, percentage. Um, but everything else here to me kind of looks fine. Um, but if we come over here and we look at the three prime expression data, if we just look at the number of genes, this graph here, just from my experience, I've learned that down here in this section is really kind of junk cells. So we want to kind of filter this out to where it looks a little bit more like this over here. Um, even in the number of reads here, when it, where there's this break right here, below that, below that is kind of just these junk cells that again that we need to filter out before we begin processing the data. Um, and that's how I that's how I filter my data. I just I have to look at the QC plots and kind of just go from there. Um, again, the flex data that I'll be showing today um, is pretty clean, so I actually didn't perform any filtering on this data. This data comes from notobiotic mice, that is mice that don't have a microbiome. Um, so this is pretty much just pure colon tissue, um, unaffected by the microbiome. This is what the data looks like when we load it into Dr. Sai's software, and then we can begin to embed it. Um, I like using the UMAP uh, because it just makes a lot more sense to me biologically um, compared to the other uh, embedding methods that you can use. Um, so the first thing when we have this plot, like I mentioned, is going to be trying to separate those colonocytes from the non-colonocytes. I use two major markers for this. I use EPCAM and ECADherin. These are going to be expressed highly in epithelial cells. And this is what I use for me to separate um, the colonocytes, which are EPCAM positive, from the non-colonocyte cells over here. 
Um, of course, this isn't enough. I have to go in and really dig deep into what these cell types are. So um, just so that you guys know, about 60%, it's really about 50 to 66% um, are colonocytes. And the other percentage, 34% is going to be these non-colonocytes. Um, and again, this is going to vary. These are mice that don't have a microbiome. Um, so in the normal wild type mice that we do see, this is going to change a little bit. There might be more immune cells because of the microbiome. Um, I'll just really briefly talk about the non-colonocytes, but it, it won't be my main focus because these cells are actually pretty easy to identify. Um, you can see that they make up just these little clusters here and they separate really nicely and we can identify them. Um, and we get all different sorts of immune cells, B cells, macrophages. Sometimes I see dendritic cells, sometimes not. There's also blood vessel cells, so endothelial cells, smooth muscle cells, neural cells, and pericytes that are all connected to the blood vessels. Then there's all sorts of fibroblasts, um, some myofibroblasts, um, and then some other types of fibroblasts that, I, like I mentioned, are um, providing um, growth factors and, and nutrients to the, to the um, colonic stem cells. And then we also see things like neurons and even adipocytes uh, show up in, in, this, in this data. Um, this is just a heat map for all of these cell types. So, so they do kind of break out really nicely, um, and I have... Uh, I'm pretty confident in, in these cell types too, but I, I haven't put a lot of focus into this. I haven't really analyzed data coming from the non-colonocytes just yet um, because my major focus has been on the colonocytes. So this is when I subsided out the colonocytes um, and then I begin to um, try to cluster these cells and see where, what are these cell types. Um, so I use k-means clustering and I kind of just play around with the numbers until I find one that really separates out everything kind of the way I like it, like visually, um, and then I can kind of go from there. So um, the first thing I do with the colonic cell types is going to be separating out the enteroendocrine cells and the tough cells, and that's just because they actually stick out from the data. So in this case here, this uh, cluster 11, I know is going to be the enteroendocrine cells, and this cluster over here, um, number three, is going to be the tough cells. And um, I, I know that by the marker genes that they're expressing as well, and we can actually calculate a score for these marker genes for the enteroendocrine cells. So you can see here, they scored really highly compared to the rest of the clusters. That's cluster 11 up here. So I know those are enteroendocrine cells. And the tough cells, again, scored really highly and different from the rest of the cells. That's number three right here. So these guys are tough cells. That's easy. Um, uh, that's actually pretty easy and, and um, shouldn't be too much hard to me. <laughs> Like again, again, it's just because they actually pull away from the rest of the cells yeah. um, because they are a you know differentiated cell type, but they are technically a specialized uh, cell type as well. Expression is so different; it just they just separate. From yeah, the rest. exactly. Um, the other cell types that I can try to pull out are goblet cells. The goblet cells are going to be this whole chunk right here, um, and I know that based on the MUC2 expressions. You can see that it expressed very highly in these clusters here. So I know those are goblet cells. I can also calculate a score for them and they do separate out compared to the rest of the clusters down here. So I know again, these are goblet cells right here. So um, I can actually subset out the goblet cells again and then begin to focus on the specific goblet cell subtypes. I know nobody really does this, but um, I thought it was very interesting because um, once I saw this, I remembered a paper that I had read that actually mentioned that there's two lineages from the goblet cells. There's a canonical and a non-canonical lineage, and that's actually what I observed here, so that was pretty cool. Um, down here, what I'm showing is um, MKI-67. This is a proliferation marker, so you can see that the clusters about right here are gonna be the cells that are proliferating. So that's interesting, because they're supposed to be generally uh, reacid, right? Yes and no. So there, um, there are actually some cycling cells yes. in there. Yeah. They're yeah. gonna divide. Um, there's also differentiation markers. So for goblet cells, a good differentiation marker is MXD1. Um, and you can kind of see that, um, well, yeah, I didn't do a good job of lining these up right, but um, down here are going to be where those um, proliferating goblet cells are. And actually this little cluster right here that you see is uh, secretory progenitor cells, or what I think are secretory progenitor cells. Um, and then we have the non-canonical goblet cells here using these two markers that I grabbed from that paper. So this kind of branch right here is uh, non-canonical goblet cells, and these over here are canonical. 
Um, you can kind of see that this non-canonical branch is actually very close. That's this branch right here. It's very close to the other colonocytes right here. Um, so it was very interesting to actually see that out on, on this 3D map. Um, but based on those markers... <laughs> that's a biology, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, that, that's right. To us, there's two branches. We don't know. Yeah, I know, I know. And I like... I, to read it. I remember that yeah. paper. Um, so for the secretary progenitor cells, um, they have different names and people call them different things. That's what makes this also very complicated. So um, I started calling them secretary progenitor cells. I believe previously we were calling them deep crypt secretary cells. Uh -huh. um, so they do have this REG4 marker. You can see that um, uh, cluster number 12 is scoring really high for this REG4 marker. That's this cluster right here. Um, and you can also see that um, Clusters 10 and 12 are also proliferating. This is a proliferation marker, so I know these are proliferating right here. DLL1 and DLL4 are expressed again in these secretary progenitors, and you can see that cluster number 12 is scoring high. It's so actually the only one that's kind of scoring. Um, so to me, these are secretory progenitor cells. Um, this is what it looks like once you actually apply um, those cell types. So we have the secretory progenitor cells here. We have some proliferating goblet cells here, and then the rest even though there's two lineages, I merged them just to simplify things. Um, those are the differentiated goblet cells. And actually, if we look at the differentiation potency, you can see that the secretary progenitor skill cells score really high in the proliferating goblet cells and then the differentiated goblet cells at the bottom. So this looks good. Um, that's what I expect from this data. Um, like I mentioned, we have these differentiated cells, but they're also very specialized cells. They have nice functions. And so you, you just saw that I was able to identify all these cell types here. The next thing would be to identify the stem cells and the absorptive uh, colonocytes. So you can kind of see from this image to this image, I got rid of all those specialized cells. And now we're really left with the backbone of what, um, I guess, colonocytes do. So the colon is largely responsible for absorbing any sort of water that the small intestine didn't absorb. Um, so that's what these cells, um, uh, that's their function, and that's why they're called absorptive. Uh, colonocytes. And so what I did was I subsetted out the stem cells and the absorptive colonocytes. They form kind of like this gradient, um, very similar, I guess, to this crypt right here. Um, they form this gradient from stem cells and transient amplifying cells down here all the way up to differentiated cells over here. So um, I know that because of LGR5 expression is located down here at these, at these clusters at the bottom. You can see that these are also the same cells that are proliferating based on proliferation markers. And then there's some differentiation markers that I use. I like to use KRT20 to um, identify the absorptive colonocytes. And um, aquaporin-8, um, this is, of course, a receptor that is responsible for pulling in water into the cells. And those are that is what I use to identify the late absorptive colonocytes. Um, I don't believe I actually have an image of that, but. Um, this is what I'm, I'm currently working on right now. Um, this is what I've had to do to be able to identify these cell clusters. My initial thinking when I first started all this single cell stuff was that, you know, we'd be able to have our cell atlas with all our gene markers and cell types and just kind of, you know, click and play and it'll identify stuff for us. I learned over a year or two that that is not possible um, at the time. Um, especially not for this particular cell type. It works actually pretty well for things that separate out really nicely, like um, uh, blood cells, like peripheral mononuclear uh, blood cells. Those do separate really nicely into T cells, B cells, NK cells, and I can actually identify them using a cell atlas. But for the colon, I just haven't been able to do that. Um, so this is what I have to do. I just have to look at the expression across um, these figures here and then try to... Uh, label these clusters here as a specific cell type. Um, again, this isn't finished just yet. I need to input a lot more details into this um, so that somebody can actually follow it. But for the most part, this is how we identify cell types in the colon. Okay. So if you have any questions, I can help you to transfer your question to Michael. And uh, maybe next time I, he has answer, I can let you know. And, but. Uh, uh, he didn't tend to give a guest lecture like this. He just report what he learned from the data itself. But it's really good learning material for me and uh, to know how the biologists use their knowledge 
he familiar with all the markers he's supposed to see. And when he see these two branches, to me it's just two branches of data points, but uh, he knows there's uh, can canonical and non-canonical uh, goblet cells. And uh, so you, you do need to embed your biology knowledge in this analysis. And uh, for those simple ones, you can just one click. Uh, T cell, B cell is OK. But uh, once you get into the details of the subclusters, then you need those levels of the training to do this. OK? And also, he mentioned in the middle of his talk some uh, look at the marker genes, so that individual markers. And he also mentioned some cell scores. OK, you remember, he, he, he said, OK, uh, that scores is for uh, calculate for each individual cells. Those scores were computed for combinations of multiple genes. So if you believe there are goblet cells, there are five markers. And uh, how you can compute the score for regarding to these five marker genes to individual cells, that's what we are. I'm going to demonstrate those and how can you compute, uh, synthesize the score for each individual cells when you're giving uh, a set of genes, OK? Those genes should be related or make sense to you. It's just not a random 20 genes. You can compute a score out of a random 20 genes. But uh, if you know what these 20 genes work together, do something, and you can compute that score for each individual cells, then you can differentiate the cells into different subclusters regarding to the function of this gene set uh, uh, carried. So if we come back to our example data, you can load any example data. Um, then there's a button, and it should be, yeah, it should be this. In the very center of the menu here, right next to, below the network, uh, this. If you click this, and you will be asked whether you want to compute a score for those cells, or you want to compute after you want to compare two groups, OK? If your data have, say, wider type and knockout, you may want to compute uh, the scores for all the cells that you want to comp compare between them. Um, so in this case, I just say, OK, we just show the values okay, for all the cells, not compare them. Then you have a selection of those, what kind of scores you want to compute. <coughs> okay, so this menu just led you to select different gene sets. Okay, some genes you want to study mitochondrial function, then you probably have 15 genes, okay, from the database, and you want to extract those names. So this menu allows you to select what kind of gene set you want to study to compute the score for. There are different options. I believe Michael selected this cell type marker scores. And he wants to study goblet cells. And he selected this database. And then he selected uh, this mouse data. And this is a goblet cell. From this database of marker genes. So I don't know how many marker genes associated with goblet cells. But yeah, we can find it out. But if you select this, the program will start to ask which algorithm you want to use to compute this score. You can select either of them. Um, OK. So the value is for every individual cell. Each cell now have one score. This score is indicate the value is indicated by this color. And uh, uh, the yellow means that the score is high. So regarding to this goblet cell marker, I don't know, there are 11 markers, OK? 
Um, this score is a synthesized from 11 genes expression and look at those expression in each individual cells. And they are, the value is higher in this cluster here. Okay, there's one cell that's really high. If everything is equal, then this cell with higher values are most likely to be the goblet cells. Okay? Um, but you can run any uh, cell type, but uh, it has to be make sense to, to the tissue. I don't know which tissue uh, the cell we are using here, so maybe goblet cell is just a random um, score I computed, and it's relative value different between cells, but not makes any sense here. But I just show you, okay, this is the way you can compute that. Um, if you want to try other uh, values, you can see, okay, I want to compute uh, a signature score, and there are multiple options. Once you have select this, then you select whether it's a mouse data or not, then you want to see, okay, you want to have a geo terminology, gene set, gene ontology. So you see that M5, and from this long list, you see I want to look at regulation of cell growth. Okay, which cell, uh, after computing, we have a highest cell growth related score out of those uh, All right, so if you learn how to click those, the next question for you is which one you want to select to understand your cell population. Uh, then at that stage, I cannot help. I just give you this and you, you know, just like Michael did, he know what cell type he want to look at and then which marker he want to highlight. Uh, he can interpret those either their differentiation or their proliferation, uh, those signatures, okay? So this is a very powerful tool, and, but uh, you just need to know how to use it, all right? Um, I don't have any other in our agenda, but I can leave this time for you for questions or, yeah. or any questions for Luis as well. Yeah, you can, you can click, give a robust test. If you run into any bugs, just let me know, give me a screenshot. Normally I can fix it in the one or two minutes uh, by looking at the code and changing the places. So another technique is to, you can brush, you can brush this cell population. See, I, I brush uh, this green cell and then ask for which cells are, uh, are marker genes for it. Top 10 marker genes. And it should give me uh, those genes that are highly expressed in the brushed cells. Yeah, so, so I brushed this particular cell type uh, subpopulation and found, okay, this is PP, PA, PPA, relatively highly expressed in the cell I brushed. But sometimes you don't find those markers, okay? So this is okay, uh, maybe it's marker. All right.
Okay, uh, let me know if you have any other questions. And the next week, we are going to talk about the clustering algorithms to uh, classification. So this week was clustering, and then classification is you based on the training data, whether you will separate your data points into this group, that group. Uh, we will talk about new, uh, neural networks. Uh, Kagata will give us a, a talk, discussion of uh, neural networks. He's, he's an expert on that topic. Okay. Yeah, Luis. Mm-hmm.